The United States is tightening the noose on firms that do business with Russia. But is Russia pulling out all the stops and reaching way back into the past and the future for ways to circumvent U.S. sanctions? I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. Let's talk about how Russia-China trade is grinding to a halt. Okay, so this is a really interesting story. Uh, Western sanctions have reportedly tightened yet again. And I actually don't think it's Western sanctions, um, but more like China's compliance with Western sanctions. And this is tightening to a point that Russia and China effectively can no longer trade in almost any currency. Um, and instead, they're resorting to, no kidding, barter trade. That's right, guys. They're trading... The two major industrialized countries are trading with the same mechanism that you trade Pokemon cards. In fact, even Pokemon cards are now purchased with legitimate currencies. Uh, this is some schoolyard level stuff. And we're going to talk about why this is such a problem. Okay. So Russia and China, as we've talked about for some time, uh, the U.S. and Western allies have been slowly tightening the, the the noose of sanctions against Chinese banks that do business with Russia. You guys know that, Ch that Russia imports a lot of its goods from China, and these are both... Uh, there's no direct military goods coming from China, but what there are is effectively precursor goods. So, for example, China won't sell Russia a, an FPV drone, but they might sell them um, batteries and uh, cameras, for example, small lightweight cameras. Obviously, parts that will go into drones, but they're not selling the drones themselves, meaning that the sanction is... Uh, limited. But what isn't limited is U.S. sanctions against the banks that facilitate these transactions. And so for the West, for the last maybe two years or so, the West and especially the United States have had a sticky inflation crisis, meaning the price in goods and services, the price of goods and services in the United States kept on rising in a way that was really punishing to the average American. That meant that the U.S. wasn't really willing to do anything that was going to raise the price of goods and services. And we know that China is the manufacturing hub of basically the entire globe. So for the U.S. to sit there and crack down on Chinese bad behavior was not really an option for them. But now, U.S. inflation is slowing. And the U.S. is saying, in fact, there is even rate cuts on the table now. And so the U.S. has said, China, we've, let, we've looked the other way while you guys have done business with Russia long enough. It's time for us to start cracking down. And crackdown they have. By some accounts, right, a, a couple months ago, we were reporting that about 80% of bank transfers in the Chinese yuan that Russia attempted were bouncing back with no explanation after sitting for weeks while the banks tried to figure out if they even could do the transaction. But, right, Russia, of course, uh, an expert at evading sanctions, would rely on smaller banks or even sometimes informal kind of currency exchangers uh, to help these transactions happen, right? A smaller regional bank is going to have less exposure to the broader global market and might be able to get in under the radar of U.S. sanctions. But the U.S. gets is also getting smarter and smarter, and those regional banks are also getting cracked down on, right? In the modern global economy, well especially one that's that's swinging back towards um, potentially growth, you're seeing a lot more interconnectedness, a lot more globalization, right? COVID slowed a lot of global traffic, but in the last, again, two years, we're seeing it open back up. So even small Chinese banks are still doing business in, in U.S.-denominated currencies and with the U.S. and its allies. But... Now, there's some reports that up to 98% of Chinese banks are not accepting payments from Russia at all, full stop. This is a huge problem for Russia as they try to continue to fund their war machine. And not only does it have to continue to advance into uh, Ukraine, but now the Russian war machine has to take back its own territory as well. So while the need has never been greater... Russia's ability to purchase and the component parts of some of their most sophisticated weapon systems have never been more limited. So, what does it mean when Russia can't make these international transactions? Well, 
It means they've got to reach deep into their grab bag and resort to bartering. Yes, bartering, right? The same thing that where you say, I'll trade you my Ken Griffey Jr. rookie card for two of your um, Wayne Gretzky cards, I'm, uh, right? And that's what we're resorting to. And there's a reason that we all stopped making that transaction in like the sixth grade, right? Because it's really hard to accurately price things. Like how many Charizards is a Bulbasaur worth? If you don't know the answer, it's because there may not be an answer. And this is where things get really, really, really tough, right? So China is discussing uh, doing trades, tradesies, right? And so there's a couple of issues. The same ones, honestly, that you encounter trying to trade your Pokemon cards in sixth grade. No, no kidding. So one, Russian firms are talking about maybe trying to trying to trade metals for Chinese machinery imports. And so you've got the first problem with the barter system is kind of baked in there is that if you're China and you are a, man, a firm that manufactures machine tools, what are you going to do with thousands of ingots of steel? Now you have to receive them somehow. You have to store them. You have to sell them, right? And then you have to collect that that profit in Yuan. But there's an even... So it's the same thing with, you know, Pokemon cards. You may sit there and be like, what am I going to do with 60 Bulbasaur's? I have Bulbasaur's in my Pokemon card deck. I don't need more of them. And so then you have to sit there and go, okay, well, I need to prearrange another trade ahead of me. So in order to make this trade, the, you know, get my two Bulbasaur's from my Charizard, I need to have my buddy lined up who needs a Bulbasaur. And if it's two, you got to go, okay, I got to have... Two buddies lined up who need Bulbasaurs. And they have to have something that I want, right? Though once you're inside, once you've done the cross border transaction, you can just sell, right? Which makes things a little easier. But again, where, where, how would you sell 60 tons of steel ingots or, or copper, an industrial sized shipment of copper, right? It's not the easiest thing in the world. It's a pain. And so that's all going to have to get priced in. So not only, right, imagine if you had to, imagine if when you bought, uh, you know, a, 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 some potato chips at your grocery store, they said, listen, you also got to pay us an extra 2% for the cost of storing the money. And they, you'd go, no, that's stupid. It's money. It doesn't cost you anything to store. You have it, right? Well, that's how this is going to have to work too. Right, because it's very expensive to store a lot of again raw metals or large quantities of goods. But there's even more problems, right? And one, exchanging goods and services, it says they have to be manually accounted for, and what they're talking about is a pricing issue. And so, not only do you have to deal with the fact that you know nobody knows uh, who wants the Bulbasaur or not, is that there's also a larger market at work. So let's say, for example, Russia was to say, hey, let's make it easy. We pull oil out of the ground all the time. Oil is a popular commodity. Why don't you just denote the transactions in oil? Sell oil for oil, right? Maybe you could even do something where it's like oil rights. So you don't have to physically ship oil to a Chinese, you know, widget manufacturer, Chinese camera manufacturer, right? Let's say... So you sit there and go, okay, we don't, we, the camera manufacturer goes, great. Just send me the rights to this Russian oil shipment and I can resell those to uh, an oil company for, for fairly low transaction fees. Well, there's one other problem and that is the variability in the market. The price of oil is always going places and the, from when the transactions agreed to, to the time the transactions executed, you actually may end up with very different oil prices. Because remember, there's a whole additional thing. Normally, you sit there and go, great, rubles for you on. You do it, here's the day the transaction happens, you look at the exchange rate, whoop, you flip it, payment complete. But this transaction is a lot tougher. Why? Because you have to first say, all right, I'm gonna trade, I have rubles, I'm gonna buy oil. How many? How many, How much oil, how much Russian oil do my rubles buy? Then you make that transaction. Then you go and say, okay, great, China. I now have this much oil. How much do I have to sell you to get you on? But you notice how when you have this three-strep transaction, you have two places 
where prices can change and things can intervene. So suddenly, let's say there's a big oil spike. Let's say, for example, a, a big oil tanker gets hit in the Red Sea after the Russian company has purchased the oil, but before they've shipped it, they've sold it to the Chinese. And the Chinese say, guys, oil's more expensive now. So we don't, maybe they'll say, hey, we don't need as much, but maybe they'll say, hey, oil got cheaper. Now you have to buy more oil than when you started to make this transaction happen. And so this sort of thing is really, really challenging. And oil is not even a good example because that's also subject to sanction. And imagine, again, if you're so talking about items that might not be sanctioned, oil is, a, is probably as close as they can possibly get, right? Really well-known commodities with really pretty stable pricing. But if you really wanted to have to barter, you'd have to sit there and go, hey, all right, China, you have... X number of, uh, okay, Russia, a Russian firm goes to a Chinese firm and says, hey, we want to buy a bunch of GPS uh, transmitters so that we can, uh, our drones can figure out where they are. And Ch the Chinese firm goes, great, you can sell us uh, um, something we need. Uh, we need um, uh, carbon fiber, like like piece of carbon fiber to help manufacture our drones. Russia goes, okay, all right, what's this carbon fiber worth to you? Well, here's the thing. What is the market like for a specific grade of carbon fiber in a specific level of finest manufactured to certain standards? But remember, it's not on the global market. It's on the highly hyper-regional market. And even worse, let's say you were to sit there and go, okay, Chinese firm, I'm, uh, Chinese firm goes great. I'll accept a ton of carbon fiber from you guys. Just sheets and sheets of the stuff. But then when they go to sell it, what happens? Well, suddenly the market is flooded with carbon fiber. So you see how the act of you making these transactions can warp the market, especially when you're talking about something highly local. Again, think about it when you're dealing with a, a very specific type of card, like let's say a very rare Pokemon card, where you say, okay, I, I have a rare foil ditto. And somebody goes, actually, I have a rich friend. He has 17 rare foil dittos. And so you make that transaction on the bus. Your buddy gets off. Now you have 17 rare foil dittos. Well, guess what, guys? They're not rare anymore. That's actually a huge problem. And on that bus, you probably wouldn't be able to give them away. This is some of the problems that barter trade comes into. But it's also a problem for the Ruskies, for the Kremlin. Because you know what you can't do? Tax it. There's very little records. And most countries don't tax barter transactions. In the United States, you could barter anything away and it's not a taxable transaction. It only becomes taxable when you convert it, when you sell it for your currency. Meaning that it's possible that some of these firms may actually just buy oil futures or whatever and then sit on them either waiting for the price to rise or literally so they could trade them back for more stuff. So Russia may actually have a problem that it becomes too successful. And this is why they're exploring even crypto payments. The problem is, of course, crypto has many of the same problems that barter does. One, cryptocurrencies, depending on the specific currency, may not be easily tracked and taxed. Even worse, cryptocurrencies are notoriously unstable meaning that they can be that the same problems of trying to trade gps units for carbon fiber also occur you also have the same problems of the three part transaction where you go rubles where you convert rubles to crypto to to dirt coin and then you could do dirt coin to yuan two chances for market fluctuations to intervene and throw your trade sideways right and remember, the other solution is, of course, to route payments through a Russian credit institution with a branch in China, but that raises the payments cost up 5% because it's a very complicated trade. So right now, again, 5% could be the entire profit of a large-scale industrial transaction. Not uncommon at all. And so you, you have to figure out a way to do it and keep transaction costs below 5% and adjust for risk. This is why 
this is, the barter system is so bad. But we're going to talk about how it's already negatively impacting the Russian economy. But of course, if you need to get your own systems together and you're looking for especially, especially as we go back to school, that's like, that's like getting sanctioned all over again. Okay. The start of school. That's why you need some strike gum, right? It's the superior energy drink alternative. And I get it. It's not for kids, by the way. Don't, don't give this to your kids. I don't know what else to tell you because I've concentrated an entire energy drink into this little piece here, right? It's got 90 milligrams of caffeine in each piece, plus hundred milligrams of alpha GPC and zero sugar. So if you're looking for the alternative to buying a $5 Red Bull, Strike Gum's the way to go. It's made in the USA. It's veteran owned. And best of all, we are having our back to school sale. Again, for parents, you're the ones who really need this. But, you know, also, if you're not a parent, you just got to sit in traffic outside of school and I get you. What happened to buses? Anyway, here's the sale. Use code strike BTS, strike back to school. Link is in the description. And you can get... If you order two or more five packs, you get free shipping. That means that it's actually cheaper to purchase three five packs instead of the 15 pack tray. I know, right? But check it out. We link to it in the description. Strike BTS, free shipping, two or more five packs. Too easy, guys. Too easy. I'm out here solving your problems. Not going to solve them for Russia and China, though. Russia is already seeing these Chinese goods their prices are rising in response to this incredibly difficult sanctioning regime. The price of Chinese cars is going to rise in Russia as early as September because it's so expensive to, for Russian importers to actually do the importing. In fact, they expect the price for Chinese cars to rise by 10% next month. That's not 10% year over year. That's 10% in a month, guys. So this is a sign, again, that it's not just military goods that are subject to this level of uh, sanction, that it's the Russian consumer who's going to get cooked, right? And as we talk about, you can see the central bank is great within Russia is raising its base interest rate to 18%, meaning that if you want commercial loan rates, you're looking at 26 to 30%. Now you're talking, there's already been a 5% rise in, in the price of new cars. Now there's going to be a 10% rise. Do you see how rapidly the Russian economy is getting cooked? It's like inflation. It's, it's like a, it's like rolling down a hill on a bike or pushing a snowball down a hill, right? It rolls a little bit slowly and then it builds speed, right? Inflation is like an animal it's in and of itself. And it is almost impossible to tame inflation when it gets to a certain point, right? Once the economy, economies start to believe and operate as though inflation is going to be massive. And when they do that, they drive more inflation. Again, if you think the cost of it's, imagine, again, you're, you're, you you go to the card store, you're buying Pokemon cards, but you know, you know that when you're there next week buying your Pokemon cards, you know the packs are going to be 50% more expensive. What do you do? Well, you know then that you're going to have to sell your Pokemon cards that you're buying today at the regular price. You're going to have to sell them for a higher price to make sure you have the cash to buy the next round of Pokemon cards. So your belief that inflation is coming is going to impact your pricing today, which in turn creates the inflation. So this is the disaster that Russia is 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 just chugga chug chugging. I mean, if it had rail lines that still worked, the train would be driving. The inflation train would be rolling. But they don't. In fact, they don't have any trains that appear to be rolling, at least not near Kursk. So instead, all they have is the inflation train. Anyway, guys, subscribe to the channel. It's free. And frankly, it makes a huge difference. Plus, a huge thank you to our Colonel Tier members, Martin Baum, Chris Rossi, Stuart Abel, Daniel Brown, Sergei Zenchenko, Chris Holmes, and Chris Gorsuch. I could not do this without you guys. I appreciate you all so very much, and I will see you all in the next one. Cheers.